Well, good morning, Crossfaders, and welcome to Crossword Online and uh, to another week as we turn to the Psalms. Uh, this week we're turning to the following Psalm uh, that we are looking at, is Psalm 26. And uh, as we begin, I'm going to read for us and then I'll pray and then we're going to take a look at it. So let me read for us. Vindicate me. Lord, for I have led a blameless life. I have trusted in the Lord and have not faltered. Test me, Lord, and try me. Examine my heart and my mind, for I have always been mindful of your unfailing love and have lived in reliance on your faithfulness. I do not sit with the deceitful, nor do I associate with the hypocrites. I abhor the assembly of evildoers and refuse to sit with the wicked. I wash my hands in innocence and go about your altar, Lord, proclaiming aloud your praise and telling of all your wonderful deeds. Lord, I love the house where you live, the place where your glory dwells. Do not take away my soul along with sinners, my life with those who are bloodthirsty in whose hands are wicked schemes, whose right hands are full of bribes. I lead a blameless life. Deliver me and be merciful to me. My feet stand on level ground. In the great congregation, I will praise the Lord. This is the passage that we are looking at this morning. So let's pray as uh, we turn and consider it in more detail. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can turn to your word, that we can consider uh, the psalm that uh, gets us to think and explore our own hearts and our own minds and the condition thereof. And so, Lord, I pray that as we look at it this morning, we may truly ask the, the real questions uh, that pertain to seeking you, uh, that pertain to investigating where we find ourselves this morning. Can we call out to you, as the psalmist does, for vindication because of who you are, regardless of our state in so many ways? And can we truly seek you? And do we find the joy uh, that uh, we can truly find in your presence? So, Lord, as we explore it this morning, I do pray that, uh, if anything, we may find the joy of your presence, the joy of knowing you, the joy of being able to be called your children. And also, all this because of your Son, Jesus Christ. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we begin, uh, perhaps a, a question, as I started last week, I asked the question, um, I, I asked, started by asking a question, uh, what are you waiting for? And this week, I want to ask perhaps another question. Uh, are you standing or are you sitting? What is your position? Do you stand or do you sit? And so uh, the reason I ask this is if you look at this passage, there's an interesting contrast in a couple of of the various pictures that get painted for us, just on face value as you look at it. Uh, let's pick up there quickly, uh, just to, to see some of the things uh, that you can find. Uh, let's look at verse, uh, verse, uh, verse 1 to 3 quickly. I'll read for us again. Vindicate me, Lord, uh, for I have led a blameless life. I have trusted in the Lord and have not faltered. Test me, Lord, and try me. Examine my heart and my mind, for I have always been mindful of your unfailing love and have lived in reliance on your faithfulness. Now, the first thing just to pay attention to, just to be aware of, is the psalmist picks up on this idea that he has not faltered. He has not. What's really uh, a fantastic word, actually, in the Hebrew is I've, I've not lost my footing. I've not fumbled. I've not stumbled. Um, forward. This isn't to say that the psalmist himself is thinking that he is without sin, but the real weight of it is how have I dealt with my sin? When I have uh, failed, have I 
have I continued to remain in that position or have I done something about it? Uh, the other thing, just keeping in mind this idea of standing or sitting. So there is this idea that the psalmist is, is aiming to stay on his feet. He hasn't faltered, so he hasn't changed his stance. He is maybe, uh, there may have been a moment of a wobble, but he has not gone into a different position. He is remaining on his feet. Uh, notice in verse 4 and 5, uh, or 4 to 7 at least, it says, I do not sit with the deceitful, nor do I associate with the hypocrites. I abhor the assembly of uh, I abhor the assembly, assembly of the wicked of the evildoers and refuse to sit with the wicked. Uh, so just up to there, you again see this contrast, at least in the picture, is he says, I do not sit with the deceitful, and I refuse to sit with the wicked. Now, maybe this, just as a bit of a side note, maybe this rings a bell or sounds very familiar. And it should, in many ways, if you've been uh, keeping with us as we've been going through the Psalms, or if you remember it for yourself, uh, one of the Psalms that we perhaps try and learn uh, in the beginning of uh, trying to learn verses or chapters in the Bible uh, is Psalm 1. And if you could go and uh, explore that for yourself, but it says, um, in verse one of uh, uh, verse one of chat of Psalm one, it says, "Blessed is the one who does not walk in the step with the wicked, uh, or stand in the way of the sinner, or sit in the company of mockers." Um, and so it's using that picture, similar kind of picture, where he is actually saying, "I don't reside, I don't take comfort, I don't sit, I don't actually relax." Uh, with the company of evildoers or the wicked, or as he says, the deceitful. Uh, and that, that is not the company that I intend to be associated with. If I have evil or wicked or done something wrong, I deal with it. Uh, then he carries on to pick up in verse 6. He says, I wash my hands in innocence and go about your altar. There's a movement, there's a, there's a fluidity to his actions. And he says, I proclaim aloud your praise and tell of all who all your wonderful deeds. Uh, and then to pick up some more ideas of the standing idea, uh, verse 8 onwards it says, Lord, I love the house where you live, the place where your glory dwells. Do not take away my soul along with sinners, my life with those who are bloodthirsty, in whose hands are wicked schemes, whose right hands are full of bribes. I lead a blameless life. Deliver me and be merciful to me. My feet stand on level ground. In the great congregation, I will praise the Lord. And so he builds it. I just want us to feel the weight as he builds the psalm to that final verse. He's, he's so focused on living his life for the Lord, living out uh, toward the Lord and not uh, indulging and giving into his sinful nature, but instead washing. Uh, so if you pick that up, he says in verse 6 that he washes his hands in innocence. It's interesting that there is this play on, on the idea. He's not saying that he is without sin, but he washes his hands in innocence. He was washing his hands in the, in the intention of being without, uh, to, be, to be cleansed, to be purified, so that he can then enter and be, in the, be at the altar and that he can proclaim God's goodness. And so this kind of builds and builds and builds to the point where he says, I stand uh, my feet stand on level ground, as he says there in verse 12. And so you have this idea of the psalmist who's standing, who's trying to remain standing uh, in the midst that there is, uh, there is wicked, evil, deceitful, hypocritical people in this world uh, and perhaps circumstances. Uh, and there are these moments where there is the danger of falling into those categories, falling victim uh, to those sinful environments. Now, it's interesting because it's not simply to say that by keeping the company of a sinner, you become a sinner yourself. The actual reality is we are all sinners, but he doesn't want to be associated with the hypocrites, the deceitful, the evildoers or the wicked. He doesn't want to be affiliated with them. And because of that, what he does is he deals with his sin. And so a lot of this language of, uh, of blamelessness is perhaps something that you would pick up in a book like Job. Job, who proclaims to be blameless, isn't again to highlight this idea that he's without sin, 
but it highlights the idea that this person, if it is David here, as it is ascribed to David, he is not necessarily without sin. We as the readers today know that David was, with, was not without sin, but that he himself did sin. But he is aware of how to deal with the sin. He knows the necessity to deal with his sin. And so the blamelessness highlights or the integrity that he has is highlighted by the fact that he deals with it. Uh, it's interesting that we, when we think about blamelessness, it's not the same as being sinless. Blameless is that if there was anything that you had done wrong, uh, someone can't go and dig it up and blame you for it. Because if you have dealt with it, you are then counted as blameless. If you've even confessed and owned up to something, you're no longer, at, in some ways, you're no longer to be blamed. You've owned up to it, you've confessed it, you've admitted it, and so you move on. It is in some ways stricken from your record. And so in, in looking at the psalm, the psalmist, in order to maintain his integrity, like Job also maintains his integrity, he deals with sin when sin presents itself, when he finds himself in sin. He is dealing with it. And so the question perhaps that you're asking is, at what point was this maybe uh, relevant to David? At uh, what point in his life? Was this that something that he wrote before he was king or perhaps after later on in his life as he had already been anointed as king, perhaps after his fall with Bathsheba? Uh, all of these could be possibilities. Perhaps it is in his later years that he realizes that the dealing with sin is so essential or perhaps it was in his youthfulness that he realized that he seeks the Lord. And whatever there is in his life, he wants to bring himself before the Lord. But what is remarkable is the way that this psalm does begin. As it starts, vindicate me, Lord. Vindicate, save, rescue. Uh, this is a psalm of a person that recognizes where vindication, where judgment, where salvation, where where rescue comes from, that it doesn't uh, come from anyone other than the Lord God himself. However, the psalmist doesn't seem to be in absolute distress, nor does it seem to be that the psalmist is surrounded by an enemy that wants to kill him. But yet the psalmist is still turning to the Lord and in many ways contemplating his, his life, contemplating the, the dangers that this life presents you with. And so perhaps that's you today. Maybe you don't feel like the enemy is infringing on your life. Maybe the enemy is not this ruthless, bloodthirsty uh, enemy as perhaps we could have picked up in last week's the, the hatred, the hating hatred of the, of the enemy that, that the psalmist was feeling. But perhaps this week it is just that ever lingering danger and temptation uh, that, that lures us away from the Lord. And so the psalmist, he recognizes, well, actually that he needs to apply uh, Psalm 1, uh, that he doesn't stand or sit in the company of sinners and mockers and scoffers, that that is not the company to be kept. And especially if, as, as this is ascribed to David, this is not the company that a king should be kept, uh, should keep. This is not the kind of uh, picture that we should get of God's king, one that is a representative of God, one that is God's Messiah, who is uh, there to lead God's people to himself. And so here we have this, this psalmist, this character, David, who is seeking God's vindication, but looking in many ways at his own heart introspectively and saying, I do not want to find myself in the camp of, uh, of the wicked, of the hypocrite, of the deceitful, uh, of the evildoers. But rather I would wash my hands and be uh, at your altar and beyond that in your presence. Uh, proclaiming aloud, as he says in verse 7, uh, your praise and telling of all your wonderful deeds. That is where the psalmist wants to be. That is the place uh, that is best. Uh, so again, I ask the question, are you standing or are you sitting? Do you find yourself right now, just as we 
pause halfway through thinking through the psalm. Are you standing? Uh, even if it feels like you're possibly wobbling, uh, losing your footing, but are you standing? Are you standing in the presence of the Lord? Are you standing uh, longing for Him? Are you standing for who He is? Are you standing in the might of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Or are you sitting? Are you sitting passively, idly in waiting as we considered last week? Are you sitting around in, in the company of mockers, of scoffers, of evildoers, of the wicked, of the deceitful, of the hypocrites? Is that the company that you are in? What is the company that you keep at this point? And I think that's part of where we are at this point in life. With everything going, around, going on around us, we, we need to take stock of where we are. Are you standing or are you sitting? For me, myself, this week, I, I've been wrestling with this. And it feels so often that more often than not, I fi- feel like I'm sitting rather than standing. Uh, and when I start to look at it, it, it cripples me. Because I, I know where I should be, but I don't feel like I'm there yet. And perhaps that's a reflection of what's going on within. Perhaps that's a reflection that work is needing to be done and chipping away is needing to be done. And this is where the psalm becomes uncomfortable for me. So maybe you are, if you're wanting to and if you're willing to, uh, admit like I'm willing to. Say Sometimes I think I'm sitting more than I'm standing. The question is, are you willing to say what the psalmist says? And I don't know if you picked up something in the psalm that makes, at least it makes me really uncomfortable in some ways. Maybe it will make you uncomfortable when you read it as well. But listen to what the psalmist says in verse uh, 2 here. Uh, He doesn't say it just once. He doesn't say it twice. He says it three times. This is very uh, stressed, a very clear indication that this is what he is calling the Lord to do. Taste me, Lord, and try me. Examine my heart and my mind. Now, that stumped me. That got me. And I'm not reading that because I want you to feel like you're exposed. But in the same breath, I want us to read it and see that we whether we want it or not, we are exposed. Because the psalmist here takes it one step further. God knows what's happening in your heart, in my heart, and in your head and my head. He knows it. But the psalmist takes it one step further and he says, not only know it, but Lord, will you examine it? Will you, will you test me? Will you test me to the core? It's interesting the, the word heart and mind is not quite the right phrase. There's a, there's a more literal phrase that you might pick up in some of the other footnotes in your Bible or something like that. But it's heart and kidney. And really what it, what it says is, Lord, examine me to my core. Examine me to the very innermost being of who I am. And I don't know how you feel about that. I think we should be in the space where we say, yes, Lord, search me. Examine me. Test me. Refine me. The the one testing, the the one aspect actually has that picture of smelting, of of when rock is heated to to get an ore or metal or mineral out of it, that, that it is smelted. And it is this picture of, Lord, put me under pressure. Test me. See what comes out when I am squeezed to my limit. And I don't know the last time you've asked the Lord to do something like that to you. But it's not something that we tend to want to ask God to do. If anything, I found myself kind of wanting to cry out to God this week. And and I did, saying, Lord, actually enough. Don't test me. Don't put any more pressure on me. And I think in a time like this, perhaps it's the last thing that we want to ask the Lord to do. 
COVID is enough. Please, no more. Don't test me anymore. But the question is, do you see the challenges in life? The obstacles, the things that seem beyond explanation as opportunities for God to refine your character, for God to shape you and to mold you. And so a lot of what I share with you this morning is a, is a for me, personal battle that I face every day in so many ways. And, and as Christians, we should be wrestling and fighting with this. We're not going to get it perfectly right. But to be like the psalmist and to have that level of confidence where he calls out and he says, Lord, test me, examine me, try me. Let's see what I'm made of so that ultimately it can come back to so ultimately that I can seek you more and discover you more. But you see, this is the thing that we don't want to do. Because we are already hurting or we are already experiencing the pressure of life all around us that we don't want anymore. But perhaps we need to look at the circumstances of our lives and what's happening around us and say, Lord, perhaps these are the opportunities in life where you are, in fact, testing and shaping us, molding us into people children fit for your kingdom and that becomes part of this picture of vindication part of this picture of salvation part of this picture of the lord creating in us who he longs us longs for us to be test me lord try me examine my heart and my mind those are strong words. Those are difficult words to simply accept. And then he carries on, for I have always been mindful of your unfailing love. If those testing, the requests for testing and refining is not enough, he says, for I have always been mindful of your unfailing love and have lived in reliance on your faithfulness. The psalmist has a confidence. The psalmist is reliant on the Lord. The psalmist depends on the Lord. The psalmist knows the Lord's love. You see, this is the beautiful thing that as you explore and unpack scriptures, there's this beautiful picture that God does what he does and allows what he allows, not because he's vindictive, not because he is just doing it for kicks but because he loves us and how does he love us he loves us so much that he is allowing us to feel the pressure feel the heat be refined so that we won't be mediocre people but that we will be perfected one day and we don't need to even always look at ourselves in that sense and i'm not saying don't but i'm saying God's word give us, gives us an incredible indication of what it means to be put under pressure, to suffer, to face hardship. And we see that at the center of what we believe. When we turn to Christ, we see that we serve a Savior who suffered, who died who was hurt, afflicted, mocked, beaten to the point of death because God, because of God's love. Because of God's love, not only for his son, but because of God's love for his people. It's in this way that God loved the world. That he sent his son to die on a cross for us. Your suffering, your hardship that you face 
is not in vain. Is not un is not beyond God's understanding. Because our Lord and Saviour Himself suffered. And unfortunately, part of the reality is just because Christ suffered doesn't mean that we escape suffering. But we escape. We escape the reality that if we had to die, or if suffering had to overcome us, that we would be raised again in Him, in His life. Now, I don't know if that comforts you, but what that tells us is that no matter how much this world can throw at us, no matter how much God could permit, Nothing can rob us of him, of himself, of what he gives us through his son, Jesus Christ. So vindicate me, Lord. For I have led a blameless life. For us today, we can say that in Christ. And when, and I have trusted in the Lord and have not faltered. And even if I have, Lord, your son has gotten it perfectly right. He was, he is the true David. He is the true Messiah that never faltered. That was not only not blameless, just not only just blameless, but sinless. So, Lord, even if you test me all the way to the point of death, may I be guaranteed, set apart, included into your people because of Jesus Christ. For I have always been mindful of your unfailing love and have lived in reliance on your faithfulness. And it's because of that that we don't take comfort by sitting around in the company of what is wicked or evil or hypocritical. That's not the place we want to be. We will rather seek to wash our hands in the innocence that Christ makes possible. And proclaim this, as he says in verse 8, Lord, I love the house where you live, the place where your glory dwells. Do not take away my soul along with sinners, my life with those who are bloodthirsty, in whose hands are wicked schemes, whose right hands are full of bribes. I lead a blameless life. Deliver me and be merciful to me. This is actually really a beautiful psalm. Something that having a chat uh, with Ludwig recently and uh, a rather uncomfortable but beautiful kind of picture that we get when we consider the psalmist in these words is sometimes we may feel pressured and tested to the point of death but it is because God loves us and he wants the best for us so in many ways we could say God loves us to death <laughs> and in some ways it's true because we see that in his son Jesus Christ that because of Christ's death and resurrection we see God's love for us and there is nothing that we can't face today there is nothing that we can't endure because at the end of the day, in Christ, we can stand as the psalmist stands and say, my feet stand on level ground. And in the great congregation, I will praise the Lord. And there's a picture that I kind of have of the psalmist, at least with the, when the psalmist says this, in the great congregation, I will praise the Lord. That there's a picture of almost an eternal picture of something still to come that the psalmist is looking ahead that actually in one 
in time, he will be in the Lord's great congregation. And this we wait and long for too. That one day, because of Jesus Christ, we will be together with the psalmist, with David. Standing in the great congregation. And that nothing that this world can throw at us, and no tests and trials can truly overcome us. As long as we stand firm and on level ground in our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we do thank you for this word. And we thank you that as we cry out, vindicate us, Lord, you have done so through your son, Jesus Christ. You have saved us. You have rescued us. You have even gone as far as saving and rescuing us from those that sit, those that are deceitful, those that are wicked and evil and hypocritical. Not the people, but the sin. You have saved us from the sin. And so, Lord, help us to seek you. Help us to long for you. Help us to desire you. Help us to know your unfailing love and your faithfulness all the more. And may we long to be in your house, in your presence in your congregation. So we thank you for this passage and we pray that it stirs us. If we are sitting, may it stir us to stand. Stand in faith. Stand in confidence of our Lord Jesus Christ. To stand for you. To be proactive. To be aware of your love, of your Son, and to be in step with you. So gracious Father, we pray that in this week that lies ahead, in the frustration of life, and how often we may feel like sitting, may we be reminded to stand in you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I pray that this is an encouraging message for you this morning. And if you find yourself sitting, sitting, feeling defeated, like we do at times, I really pray and hope that you may stand up. Stand up along with me in the knowledge and trust and joy that our Lord and Savior is faithful and loving. Let's stand today. Have a wonderful day. We'll see you all next week. Cheers. Bye.